Mr. President, pro tem. The majority leader the senator is from Vermont. Majority leader is recognized, the senator from New York. Now, Mr. President, it came to our attention last night that members of the National Guard, after standing on duty to protect the Capitol for Inauguration Day, keeping us safe, were sleeping in parking garages and cramped quarters without proper space or ventilation. It, is, it was utterly unacceptable. I have told those who run the security of the Capitol that it can never happen again, and I pledge to every National Guard member that it will not happen again. The minute I heard about this outrage last night, we made sure it was fixed immediately. Every member of the Guard was found proper accommodations inside, and as of this morning, everyone was accounted for and taken care of. This morning, I went over to the CVC, and I spoke to a number of Guardsmen personally to make sure they were okay. I want to thank Senators Hassan, Duckworth, Kelly, and Heinrich for their work on this matter last night, as well as Senator Lujan, who went around late at night to make sure things were okay as well. And I want to thank all the members who were concerned and lent a hand. I also want to particularly thank Acting Sergeant at Arms Jennifer Hemingway, who, when we told her about this situation, patrolled the floors of the Capitol complex until past 3 a.m to ensure that no one was left behind or not where they belonged. And she was back at her desk, first thing today to follow up. We owe an enormous debt of gratitude to the men and women who worked to keep us safe on January 6th and the days since. A situation like last night will never happen again. Now, <clears throat> I've spoken about the Senate's agenda for the next several weeks. We have three essential items on our plate. One the confirmation of President Biden's cabinet and other key officials. Two, legislation to provide desperately needed COVID relief. Three, a second impeachment trial of Donald Trump. The Senate must and will do all three. COVID relief, confirmation of nominees, an impeachment trial. Now, the first order of business is to fulfill our constitutional duty to advise and consent on the President's appointments to his Cabinet. This morning, the Senate will vote to confirm President Biden's nominee for Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin. Mr. Austin will be the first African American to ever helm the Defense Department in its history, a powerful symbol of the diversity and history of America's armed forces. Mr. Austin has a storied career in the Army but those days are behind him. As Secretary of Defense, he promised to empower and lift up his civilian staff, and I believe he will be an outstanding Secretary of Defense for everyone at the Pentagon, service members and civilian employees alike. The Secretary of Defense, of course, has a hugely important task ahead of him. He must once again demonstrate to the world that the U.S. military will always support our friends deter our adversaries, and if necessary, defeat them. Lloyd Austin is the right person for the job. He has the experience, the vision, and the competence to run the largest agency in our government. I look forward to confirming his nomination shortly. Afterwards, the Senate must continue to install President Biden's team by confirming Secretaries of State, Homeland Security, and Treasury. We need Republican cooperation to confirm these nominees, but we expect that cooperation to continue. The continuity of our national security, military, and intelligence policy, as well as our ability to effectively respond to the current health and economic crises, depend on having these cabinet officials confirmed. Now, as I mentioned, the Senate will also conduct a second impeachment trial for Donald Trump. I've been speaking to the Republican leader about the timing and duration of the trial, but make no mistake, a trial will be held in the United States Senate, and there will be a vote on whether to convict the President. I have spoken to Speaker Pelosi, who informed me that the articles will be delivered to the Senate on Monday. Now, I've heard some of my Republican colleagues argue 
that this trial would be unconstitutional because Donald Trump is no longer in office. An argument that has been roundly repudiated, debunked by hundreds of constitutional scholars, left, right, and center, and defies basic common sense. It makes no sense whatsoever that a president or any official could commit a heinous crime against our country and then be permitted to resign so as to avoid accountability and a vote to disbar them from future office. It makes no sense. Regardless, the purveyors of this unusual argument are trying to delay the inevitable. The fact is the House will deliver the article of impeachment to the Senate. The Senate will conduct a trial of the impeachment of Donald Trump. It will be a full trial. It will be a fair trial. But make no mistake, there will be a trial, and when that trial ends, senators will have to decide if they believe Donald John, Donald John Trump incited the erection, insurrection against the United States. Now, over the course of, of elections in November and January, the American people chose to retire four Republican senators and elect a Democratic majority to this Senate. The Senate must now take the basic step of passing an organizing resolution and setting up the rules for, for a Senate where there are 50 members of either party. Luckily, we have a clear precedent for what to do in this situation. In 2001, then Majority Leader Lott and Minority Leader Daschle came together and agreed on a set of rules to govern a 50-50 Senate. We should follow that precedent. We have offered to abide by the same agreement the last time there was a 50-50 Senate. What's fair is fair. That is precedent. We could organize the Senate today if both sides agreed to abide by the same rules as last time. The Republican leader, however, has made an extraneous demand that would place additional constraints on the majority, constraints that have never been in place before. In fact, his proposal would remove a tool that the Republican leader himself used twice in just the last Congress to accelerate the confirmation of Republican nominees. Leader McConnell's, proposable, sorry, leader McConnell's proposal is unacceptable, and it won't be accepted. And the Republican leader knew that when he first proposed it. Only two days ago, Mr. President, we celebrated the inauguration of a new president and the turning over of a new leaf. The American people want us to work together and move past the meaningless political fights and gridlock that have plagued us for too long. It's time to get to work. The first step is for the Republican caucus to agree to follow the same precedent that governed the Senate last time around. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Republican leader. Yesterday evening, we learned that some of the National Guard forces who've been helping protect the Capitol complex were being made to rest in parking garages between their ships. I don't think a single senator feels that was acceptable. I'm glad the situation was resolved, and I hope we learn exactly what happened. In that regard, I want to thank all the National Guard, including more than 300 Kentucky Guardsmen, and local and federal law enforcement who've helped supplement our very own Capitol Police in the wake of January the 6th. Your Congress and your country appreciate all you've done to secure the Capitol and the inauguration. Later today, I'll have the honor of meeting a number of my Kentuckians who've been helping out here at the Capitol. It's gonna be the highlight of my day. In the near future, Congress needs to smartly transition toward a more sustainable security presence. Keeping the Capitol safe cannot and will not require huge numbers of uniformed troops and vast systems of emergency fencing to remain in place forever. With the inauguration behind us, we should find the right middle ground between the unacceptable lapses three weeks ago and the extraordinarily short-term measures that have been put in place since that time. <clears throat> in the meantime, we need to make darn sure that we look after the men and women who look after us. Now, Mr. President, on a totally different matter, 
While business proceeds on the floor, the Democratic leader and I are continuing to flesh out the structure of this 50-50 Senate. When leaders Lott and Daschle wrote a similar agreement 20 years ago, <clears throat> there wasn't a need at all to reaffirm the basic standing rules that govern legislation here in the Senate. It was safely assumed that no majority would break this rule for short-term gain. Floor remarks surrounding those 2001 discussions specifically cite the legislative filibuster as an important and unquestioned part of the backdrop that lay beneath the negotiations on the finer details. It was assumed no one would ever take that step. After the fact, Leader Daschle, the Democrat, praised the legislative filibuster as a crucial rule. President Biden has praised this distinctive feature of the Senate on many occasions. Our current Democratic colleagues used it liberally, liberally over the last several years when they were in the minority. More than two dozen signed a bipartisan letter in 2017 saying our Republican majority should not break the rule by brute force. Let me say that again. Two dozen Democrats signed a bipartisan letter in 2017 saying our Republican majority should not break this rule by brute force. I agreed. I didn't do it. President Trump was not happy with that. He tweeted against me numerous times because I didn't do put an end to the legislative filibuster. And so the Democrats used it constantly, as they had every right to. They were happy to insist on a 60-vote threshold for practically every major bill I took up. So we'll continue to request that our Democrat colleagues reaffirm this standing rule of the Senate, which they have been happy to use on many occasions, I can attest. If we're going to truly replicate the 2001 agreement, we need to reaffirm this crucial part of the foundation that lay beneath it. Yesterday, I also shared a proposal for the pretrial steps in the Senate impeachment process that appears to be headed our way, and as I understand, it must be headed our way Monday. By Senate rules, if the article arrives, we have to start a trial right then. This impeachment began with an unprecedentedly fast and minimal process over in the House. The sequel cannot be an insufficient Senate process that denies former President Trump his due process or damages the Senate or the presidency itself. Senate Republicans strongly believe we need a full and fair process where the former president can mount a defense and the Senate can properly consider the factual, legal, and constitutional questions at stake. For that reason, we suggest the House transmit this article next Thursday, but that's apparently going to be next Monday, that former President Trump's answer and the House pretrial brief, I suggested, be due on February 4th, and the former President's pretrial brief be due, I suggested, on February the 11th. That timeline would have provided the Senate some more floor time before we step up fully into the unknown of a trial, which, by the way, would have been a substantial benefit to the incoming administration and allowed them to get more of their cabinet confirmed, which we are cooperating as best we can to expedite. So finally, Mr. President, on one final matter, Regarding those nominees, we're considering to, uh, President Biden's nominees for key cabinet posts on Wednesday. Avril Haynes was confirmed as Director of National Intelligence on a big bipartisan vote, including my own. We hope to be able to consider a Tony Blinken to be the Secretary of State early next week. Today, we're considering General Lloyd Austin, President Bush, uh, Biden's nominee, to be served as Secretary of Defense. I voted to approve the waiver that would allow him to serve in this post yesterday, notwithstanding the seven-year cooling-off period after military service. And I'll be voting in favor of his confirmation. I'm voting yes because the nominee is clearly qualified and because presidents should get real latitude to fill their terms with qualified mainstream people of their choosing. 
At the same time, the Senate should pause and reflect on the fact that we'll have begun two consecutive presidential administrations by issuing a waiver to a four-star general and former CENTCOM commander to lead the Pentagon. The Armed Services Committee held a hearing last week to examine the waiver and the current state of civil-military relations at the Pentagon. I expect the committee will continue to pay close attention to this important issue in the months ahead and will investigate steps the Congress can take to help restore balance over at the Pentagon. The law that we keep waiving actually exists for a good reason. Civilian control of the military is a fundamental principle of our republic. We emphatically do not want high-ranking military service to become a tacit prerequisite for civilian leadership posts over the Department of Defense. It's not just about a simplistic fear that the military will end up running itself. To the contrary, many experts worry that military leaders appropriate fixation on being non-political may not prepare them for the job to forcefully fight for armed services amid the political rough and tumble in the executive branch and here in Congress. Put another way, they're taught from the beginning to stay out of politics entirely, but you do want a Secretary of Defense who's willing to engage in the issue-based discussions that we have related to the department. So nevertheless, I'll vote today to confirm a clear patriot with an impressive career, but I'll cast that vote with the understanding that our new Secretary of Defense specifically commits to balancing civil military relations, empowering civilian leaders at the Pentagon, and playing an active role in the inherently political budget process to get our forces what they need. Our intensifying competition with China and Russia and all the other threats we face demand nothing less. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Morning business is closed. And under the previous order, the Senate will proceed to the executive session to consider the following nomination, which the clerk will report. Nomination, Department of Defense, Lloyd James Austin of Georgia to be secretary. Hmm. Under the previous order, there will be 10 minutes of debate equally divided in the usual form. Mr. President. Senator from Rhode Island. Mr. President, uh, it's my understanding that Chairman Inhofe uh, is en route to uh, provide his comments, and I be want to begin by thanking him for his tremendous leadership. Without his uh, dedication to a bipartisan, thoughtful process, we would not be here today, and it's the hallmark of his leadership throughout the years we served together. And uh, I anticipate his arrival, but... Uh, I will, I will uh, in order to expedite the vote, let me proceed. Uh, Mr. President, I rise to express my support for the confirmation of uh, Lloyd Austin to be the Secretary of Defense of the United States. General Austin is an exceptionally qualified leader with a long and distinguished career in the United States military. He served at the highest echelons of the Army and captive service as the commander of U.S. Central Command. His character and integrity are unquestioned and he possesses the knowledge and skill to effectively lead the Pentagon. The United States faces many complex security threats. If confirmed as the Secretary of Defense, General Austin will lead the department during a time when U.S. strategic priorities have shifted to focus increasingly on near-peer competition with China and Russia. The department must also transform how it operates with an increased focus on critical technologies like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, biotechnology, and cybersecurity, while also emphasizing rapid delivery of advanced new weapon systems on timelines that keep pace with technological change. In addition, President Biden must address urgent and dire challenges that few of us would have anticipated four years ago. Our country is in the midst of a pandemic that has claimed hundreds of thousands of lives, infected millions more, and resulted in billions of economic damage and the virus is still not under control. Recently, it was revealed that large segments of the federal government and major companies were hacked by Russia. We are still trying to ascertain 
the extent of the breach, but it could be the most significant cyber intrusion in the history of our country or perhaps the world. This event, too, should prompt us to move promptly to fill cabinet positions that are critical to our national security. And unfortunately, the Department of Defense is adrift and in desperate need of steadfast leadership. Over the course of the past four years, there has been repeated turnover at senior levels of the department and a concerted effort to purposely leave multiple senior level civilian offices unfilled, necessitating the installment of career or mid-level officials into positions in an acting capacity. Unlike the nominees for cabinet positions, Congress must provide as Senator McConnell indicated, an exception for General Austin to serve as the Secretary of Defense. Under the current statute, individuals are prohibited from appointment if they are within seven years of the military service. Congress found itself in a similar situation four years ago when President Trump nominated General James Mattis to be the Secretary of Defense. Now, prior to General Austin's confirmation hearing, the Senate Armed Services Committee held a hearing on civilian control of the armed forces that focused on the erosion of civil military relations. At the hearing, valid concerns were raised about providing another way or so soon after Secretary Mattis. However, at his nomination hearing earlier this week, General Austin pledged his commitment to repairing civil military relations while also empowering the civilian personnel within the Department of Defense. These were critical comments from General Austin and ones that I support. Therefore, yesterday, I voted in favor of the legislation to provide General Austin with an exception to serve as a Secretary of Defense, and I was pleased the legislation received strong bipartisan support. General Austin is an outstanding choice to serve as Secretary of Defense. I'm proud to support his nomination, given the unique challenges we face. And Mr. President, I think from now on, uh, in a few moments, we can refer to him as Secretary Austin, which is the appropriate title for his role. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor to my colleague and uh, the chairman, Mr. Dan Hall. Mr. President, I... Senior Senator from Oklahoma. Mr. President, yesterday uh, I had the opportunity to respond to the majority on my support for Tony Blanken, uh, the Secretary of State. Uh, he's one that I've known for a long period of time, and I, and, uh, I think that we'll see with the new administration here, as myself being a conservative Republican, and, and uh, the, there'll be some of the appointments that I will not, will not really get excited about and agree with, in which case I will state it. But in the case of the Secretary of State, I expressed myself yesterday, and I want to do it again today for the, what I consider to be the really critical first appointment, uh, second appointment that the new administration makes, and that would be for General Austin to be the, uh, the, the person in charge at a time that's very unique. And I agree with the senator who just spoke about the qualities of this general. We know that he's been, uh, uh, he rose to the ranks through the Army to become the first four, uh, uh, become the four-star general commander of the Central Command from 2013 to 2016. He's done everything right. We, right now, and I know the chair is aware of this, and certainly the, uh, the uh, ranking member of the committee is aware of this. We're in the most threatened times that we've been in. We have China and Russia out there with capabilities that we didn't really believe we would find ourselves with. So that's gonna be the primary concern of this uh, new administration. And I can't think of a better person to take the, 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 uh, the helm uh, than General Austin to uh, provide the leadership. And it's true that we had to have a waiver yesterday. That waiver was overwhelmingly supported in a bipartisan way. And uh, so that we, everyone knows that we gave a lot of thought to it. And this is a time when we really needed someone with the background of General Austin to take that position. And I strongly support it and look forward to serving with him. Under the previous uh, order, the question uh, of the nomination occurs on the nomination. Is there a yeas? Is there affirmative? Yeas and nays? Yeas and nays have been, it appears to be. 
Clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell. Mrs. Capito. I'm definitely not betting on that, sir. <laughs> Mr. Cardin. Do you want to vote? Who won't? Oh, thank you. She's back in West Virginia. I got you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How's it feel up there, Joe? I've done it before. I'll call it out. It's been a long time. Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton. Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Gillibrand. Thank you. Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mr. Haggerty, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Hickenlooper, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith. Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lujan, Ms. Lummis, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. Marshall, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Padilla, Mr. Paul, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby. Thank you. Thank you. Here. Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. 
Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Tillis. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Tuberville. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Warner. Mr. Warnock. Ms. Warren. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative. Blumenthal. Brown. Cantwell. Carper. Casey. Cassidy. Cornyn. Cotton. Kramer. Danes. Durbin. Ernst. Grassley. Heinrich. Inhofe. King. Lankford. Manchin. Reed. Scott of Florida. Shaheen and White House. No senator voted in the negative. Mr. Wyden, aye. Mr. Leahy, aye. Mr. Kelly, aye. Mr. Risch, aye. Mr. Portman, aye. Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Tester. Aye. Mr. Hickenlooper. Aye. Ms. Smith. Aye. Pardon me? Mr. Tuberville, aye. Mr. Padilla, aye. Ms. Stabenow, aye. Mr. Kane, aye. Mr. Paul, aye. Mr. McConnell, aye. Mr. Bennett, aye. Mr. Lee, no. Mr. Warner, aye.
Mrs. Feinstein, aye. Mr. Rubio, aye. Mrs. Murray, aye. Mr. Murky, aye. Thank you. Mr. Braun, aye. Mr. Coons, thank you. Mr. Marshall, aye. Ms. Lemus, aye. Mr. Coons, aye. Mr. Hawley, no. Mr. Rounds, aye. Mr. Johnson, aye. Mr. Carden, aye. Mr. Booker, aye. Mr. Sanders, aye. Mr. Peters, aye. Mr. Warnock, aye. Mr. Van Hollen, aye. Ms. Rosen, aye. Mr. Barrasso, aye. Mr. Kennedy, 
Aye. Mr. Romney. Aye. Mr. Ossoff. Aye. Mr. Wicker. Aye. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Mrs. Fisher. Aye. Confirmed. Ms. Hassan. Aye. Ms. Cinema, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Mr. Young, aye. Mr. Schatz, aye. Mr. Haggerty, aye. Mr. Menendez, aye. Mr. Shelby, aye. Ms. Hirono, aye. Mr. Sass, aye. Mr. Graham, aye. That's
Mr. Crapo, aye. Mr. Lujan, aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Scott of South Carolina, aye. Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Bozeman, aye. Ms. Warren, aye. Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Schumer, aye. Mrs. Blackburn, aye. Ms. Cortez Masto, aye. Mr. Merkley, aye. Mr. Thune, aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Ms. Klobuchar. Ms. Klobuchar, aye.
Ms. Duckworth, aye. Mr. Cruz, aye. Mr. Hoven, aye. Wishing to vote or change your vote? Okay. Right now? Are there any senators wishing to vote or change their vote? If not, the yeas are 93, the nays are 2, and the nomination is confirmed. Thank you. Under the previous order, the motion to reconsider is considered made and laid upon the table and the President will be immediately notified of the Senate's actions. Senator, from Oregon. Senator from Oregon is recognized. Madam, Madam President, I'm having a little trouble hearing. 
Madam President. Please take your conversations outside. The Senate will come to order. Senator from Oregon is recognized. Thank you, Madam President. First, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate be in a period of morning business with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each. Madam President, I have one request for committees to meet during today's session of the Senate. They have the approval of the majority and the minority leaders. Duly noted. Madam President, a few minutes ago, Chair Janet Yellen was approved by the Senate Finance Committee to be the Secretary of Treasury by an extraordinary 26 to 0 vote. I have seen times around here in the Senate where you come away convinced you couldn't get 26 to nothing among senators to buy a soda. And I want to thank Senators Grassley and Crapo for working very closely. The Senate will come to order. Thank you, Madam President. I want to thank Senators Grassley and Crapo for working very closely with me and Senate Democrats to achieve this remarkable vote this morning. The fact is, Janet Yellen has been confirmed by this body four times. She really belongs in the Senate Confirmation Hall of Fame. And the reason that she's been confirmed all of these times is because of what we saw at her confirmation hearing on Tuesday. She did a superb job. After the hearing, she responded to hundreds of questions in a substantive way uh, that came uh, from colleagues and has made a real commitment to transparency. Now, I know that senators are working on a variety of issues now, but I would like to say that I think given the urgency of the economic challenge our country faces. In a truly perilous economic time, I would very much like to work with all of my colleagues, particularly Senators Crapo and Grassley, Senators Crapo on the floor, to find a way to today bring up Chair Yellen for confirmation to be our Secretary of Treasury and I want to say I very much appreciate the conciliatory way this was um, discussed today. And I really hope that the Senate can uh, vote on her nomination today. Madam President, I yield the floor. The Senate